I would talk about is uh, at least what I think is uh, an important uh, uh, consideration is uh, in sort of transitioning. And, and the, the big thing that's changing is the fact that we're, we're seeing, at least in, in California, and I'm pretty sure in Spain as well, uh, intermittency at both ends of the grid. In other words, at the customer's premises as well as uh, in the high, high voltage transmission network. And there are, interestingly enough, many technologies out there, lots of activity certainly uh, going on in Silicon Valley uh, in California to address these. And, but the big problem is just the business case does not exist. And the, the thing that I guess the big point that I would want to get across today is just to say that price volatility is the friend of renewables, the friend of storage. Uh, without price volatility, uh, it's very hard to see how many of the things that we would like to see happen in the electricity sector will actually happen. All I've drawn up here is just a marginal cost curve, the extreme case of 100% you know, renewables, say, which is, uh, I'm not claiming that's going to happen, but you know, we have prices at zero, prices that are set here, that the scarcity with respect to the supply price is very high, we can even have prices that are negative, uh, and then maybe when the thermal units come in. But the basic idea is, uh, if we're really serious about a lot of renewables, uh, we're going to have a lot of price volatility. That price volatility is what is going to make the business case for these kinds of things. There is only one problem, is that uh, typically, at least in the United States, uh, regulators have a very hard time with price volatility uh, and uh, do all they can uh, to attempt to uh, essentially uh, uh, reduce it. Uh, and uh, what, what this means, though, is, is that you know, you're also hurting the business case for storage because storage is buy low, uh, sell high. That's how storage derives value. Uh, and uh, a high price that's constant uh, that's no case for storage. Uh, and so the real puzzle is how do we, if you like, capture the benefits of these uh, uh, you know, prices that are likely to come as a result of a high degree of renewables uh, and uh, create the business case for a lot of these technologies. And, and so that's the, the, the basic uh, idea uh, of what I'd like to talk about today is essentially what I would call four aspects of a wholesale and retail electricity pricing that I think that at least uh, I've learned from my experience uh, in a number of markets and hopefully I will sprinkle in a number of examples from markets uh, around the world is the first is what I'll call this match between the market mechanism and system operation. The next is managing local market power since one of the and system wide market power since not every high price or volatile price is the result of true uh, scarcity conditions. Uh, it can reflect the exercise of market power. The other is w w what I'll call a symmetric treatment of load and generation, meaning we want to treat both load and generation the same way. And then finally, uh, what I'll call is a, we call in the United States, long-term resource adequacy mechanism. Um, and I won't talk about sort of down to the distribution level, but I'll just give a plug to a paper of mine uh, that, that looks at this, this question. Um, so the first, as we said, is this, the one major lesson is this match between the market mechanism used to set prices and how you actually operate your electricity network. Uh, and and the, the, the basic way that I think is easiest to understand this is to say, Eventually, physics wins. And everybody knows that eventually physics wins. And if eventually physics wins, then suppliers will take actions that exploit the fact that they know that physics eventually wins. And so a standard thing that happened in, in California, and it is true in many markets, is, they, is the assumption that there is a what we call copper plate, meaning there is, there is no congestion in the market. We set a single price for the entire market. But we know that the reality is, is that many low price units can't be accepted because of the configuration of the network. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we are going to have a, 
typically a non-market mechanism in the early stages of the California market, and as well as currently in the Colombian market, they have what's called positive and negative reconciliation payments. We in California called them inks and decks, but the basic idea was these were things where we had to essentially pay suppliers above the market price to sell more and buy power from the constrained off suppliers. And what happened is, is that suppliers quickly figure this out and essentially ex take actions to exploit the fact that they know that this is going to occur. Uh, and this redispatch process, it, it, it becomes increasingly expensive because that is how uh, the players uh, actually make money. So what's the solution? Well, the solution to the problem and is one that we learned the hard way in, in the United States uh, since virtually all the markets in the United States started as, uh, as either single zone markets or sm a small number of zone markets and all of them transition to what's called uh, locational marginal pricing. And this is where what we do is we effectively price all relevant operating constraints. So we set up the dispatch as a minimize the as-bid cost to meet both energy and ancillary services demand at all locations in the network subject to all network and other operating constraints. And so what happens is, is that we, we continually make sure that the network model used to set the prices is essentially as close as possible to how power flows in the grid. And an important consideration in this is, is, that, you know, is, is, is to ensure that, the, that uh, this occurs. And so constantly the system operator and the stakeholder processes are, are trying to make sure that those two things are true. And as I said, all the US markets are LNP, New, England, New Zealand, as well as Singapore uh, also as well. Uh, and so one of the things that often arises with LNP is, is this idea that it punishes consumers that live in the major load centers. So for example, uh, customers in San Francisco would certainly pay more than customers in the Central Valley uh, of California. Uh, but typically what happens is, is that generators will be paid the LMP at their location, but then all retail load in a given utility service territory will pay the what's called load aggregated price, meaning you take the locational marginal prices for all withdrawal points, you take the quantity weighted average, and that's the price that all loads pay. And it, and it turns out that that ha actually has some pro-competitive benefits, but it also addresses this sort of fairness concern that, that many people have. And so this is quite uh, essentially done throughout all the LNP markets in the United States. So the big advantage of the LNP markets in a world in which you're attempting to scale up the amount of, of intermittent renewables is this fact that you simultaneously purchase both the energy as well as the ancillary services. So market participants submit their bids for ancillary services, all the ancillary services their units are capable of providing, bids for all the energy their units are capable of providing. The optimization problem solves for the best way to use those bids to meet demand at all locations. The network sets prices at all those locations. The other is it allows uh, the, the, these, uh, these units that have uh, non-convexities or, you know, or as we call them, donut holes in, in how they operate to effectively get a dispatch schedule that works for them for all 24 hours of the day. And then we have a real-time market. So there is what's called a multi-settlement, meaning a day-ahead forward market that sets the schedules for all 24 hours for all ancillary services, and then a real-time market that essentially clears the ancient balances doing the same, same way. So the big advantage of this LMP market is the fact that you cannot get an infeasible schedule uh, that doesn't, is not consistent with the physics of the network because in solving for the schedule, in solving for the prices, you're always respecting the operating constraints on the transmission network so that this situation of market participants exploiting the fact that physics wins never arises. And one of the interesting things in some work that they've done on the transition in California 
uh, we found that effectively about operating the system as a result of just moving from a, a multi-settlement LNP market from a multi-settlement zonal market, so there was three zones, congestion zones in California, moving from that zonal market design to this locational marginal pricing reduced the variable cost of operating the system by about 3%. Now, uh, that 3% is roughly about $100 million. So uh, it clearly and very easily paid for itself uh, quite, quite quickly. And as I said, the savings in, in other markets seem uh, quite great. And the other is just to go further, is as you can see that as California wants to scale up the amount of renewables, so remember uh, what we have is 33% by 2020 is the goal. And the one thing that you can see is for all of the ancillary services that are procured, so we have uh, the regulation uh, and then we have what's called load following, you can see that all of those are slated to scale up considerably. And so one of the nice things about this uh, trans using LMP is you can just build that right into the optimization problem uh, to procure the, the ancillary services that you need and co-optimize them with the energy. So um, the other thing that's nice about the LMP markets as well is it prices the local and global scarcity which is likely to occur in a market where you have these, uh, uh, the, where you have uh, renewables. In particular, as you saw in my curve, when you hit out to the capacity of renewables, that is effectively scarcity pricing. LNP will do that automatically for you. So given that you, the next stage in the process is, you know, the fact that most of the transmission networks, and particularly one of the things that made LNP so essential in the United States is that as our former Secretary of Energy said, we had, we're attempting to run a 21st century market on top of a 19th century grid, uh, and that's quite true. The, the, the transmission networks in the United States were certainly not as extensive as most of the European countries, and so it really was important that, um, uh, that, that we had a congestion management protocol because of the fact that uh, you know, generators could now take advantage of their position in the network uh, to raise the price, whereas in the vertically integrated regime, it, those were both inside the same firm, and so the firm had no incentive to try to uh, dispatch more expensive units because that would just simply increase its cost, whereas with transmission separated from generation, once again, market participants take actions to exploit the configuration of the network and what you can get is situations where uh, they are essentially a local monopolist and can set price at whatever level they want. And so what this has necessitated is essentially what we call a local market power mitigation mechanism. And all, uh, all LMP markets have uh, one of these mechanisms. They differ in terms of how they work. But the basic situation is that first step is determine when the conditions are worthy of mitigation, mitigate the offers to some agreed upon level, and then determine how you get paid for the people who are mitigated and unmitigated. There's sort of two classes of procedures, as you can see, what are called conduct and impact or market structure based. But as you can see, all the US markets have these mechanisms in place to prevent this you know, very uh, ability of suppliers to exploit their position in the transmission network. Uh, and the thing is, is that the other thing that's certainly true is you scale up the amount of renewables, these sorts of circumstances are going to happen far more frequently, just simply because when the wind's not available or the uh, sun's not available, the thermal supplier certainly has an advantage or the entity that's a stored energy can set price almost wherever they want. And so, you know, it's, these, these, this local market power mitigation is going to be even more important as we move forward uh, in a world in which we have uh, a, a larger amount of intermittent renewable resources. So the next step is, is this, is this my, my point about what I like to say is, and this is one that you know, can often make me unpopular with people in favor of restructuring, but my feeling is, is that unless you're willing to let consumers see efficient price signals, 
don't restructure, because it's very unlikely to benefit consumers. And after all, that is the purpose of restructuring, is to benefit consumers with a, a, you know, a essentially more efficient electricity supply industry. And so the, the idea is that we should treat consumers the same way that we treat generators, that your default price for your consumption should be the same price that the generator faces as their default price. The important point is the consumer doesn't need to pay this price, but just like a generator doesn't need to receive this price, if they sign a hedging agreement, they get the price in the hedging arrangement, and it's the same thing for consumers. And you know, so the, the, the idea is, is, is just, just that, that simple, uh, but it, it, the important point is, is figuring out ways to have people uh, essentially manage this risk, but it is this default price risk. And the thing is, is there's, there's lots of evidence with respect to people's ability uh, to, to manage these things. But the first steps are is just we need interval meters because you can't, if you cannot meter it, you can't price it. The other is adequate information. People need to understand what the price is. And the other is, is that you need to set uh, efficient pricing. In the United States, we've had lots of experience with what I'll call sort of day ahead uh, uh, kinds of dynamic pricing programs. And interestingly enough, in some work that we've been, I've been do, done with some folks in Denmark, we've actually been doing things in real time in the sense of giving people text messages very close uh, to when they need to shift and have, have found surprisingly good experience with this. So it's just a question of, unfortunately, changing people's approach to how they consume electricity, uh, but effectively recognizing that, that they need to do their part in managing this uh, price risk that is certainly going to come and giving them the tools to allow them to do that. But without this symmetric treatment, you effectively, as I said right here, you destroy the incentive for consumers to make investments in storage. So a good example would be is, for, for me, if I have a fixed price for all my consumption, why in the world would I ever install storage? Because storage only makes money for me to the extent that it allows me to avoid the high price. So I need to face that price in order to want to invest in storage or other load shifting technologies. Uh, but it's not to say that I have to pay that price. Uh, I mean, it, 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 if I sign a hedging arrangement or something else, but I at least need to be exposed to it to create that business case uh, that is going to lead to people making these investments. Okay, the last point is this one about resource adequacy. Um, and there's sort of, what I'd say there's two uh, dominant resource adequacy paradigms. Is the first is sort of, is what we'll call the capacity-based resource adequacy mechanism, and the energy-based uh, is probably a, a little too, but in Latin America, I think this, this has a lot to recommend it as the cost-based energy market, meaning that what they have is suppliers do not actually make offers. They simply get dispatched by the system operator based on their technical characteristics. And this paradigm exists in a number of Latin American countries. The energy-based one is primarily where what you have are long-term contracts for energy to hedge day ahead real-time price risk and finance new investment. This is the case in most industrialized countries. Um, but this, this sort of other one of effectively a bid-based capacity payment mechanism with a bid-based energy market, that's quite unique to the United States. And I'm doing my best to try not to let it spread anywhere else. Oops, excuse me, for the obvious reason that hopefully you'll see by the end of this. And the historical rationale for this is that we need offer caps on our energy market because there's an inelastic demand for real-time electricity due to the fact that I'm charging customers a fixed retail price that doesn't vary with the hourly system demand. And then you have this capped energy market which creates the so-called missing money, which means that because prices can't rise to a level for all generators to cover their capital costs, we have this missing money, so we need a capacity payment uh, to provide that. Uh, as an academic, I always like to say to people that capacity payments are the academic equivalent of tenure. I get paid to breathe. Uh, but I personally, I think we want to make market participants work a little bit harder uh, for their money 
And so what we get is capacity payment is it requires all typically retailers to purchase a pre-specified percentage, say, depending upon the environment, 15 to 20% above peak demand in this, this thing called installed capacity. Um, and, you know, as you might expect, the system operator and stakeholders, generators in particular, certainly have a high incentive to get that thing high. And the big problem with this capacity and payment rationale is if we have interval meters, we can charge people a default price equal to the hourly real-time price. So we're not in that world that was the historical justification for the capacity payment. And moreover, given the cost of interval meters, given that they are going to need to be replaced, that looks a little less. The other is, is that essentially setting a capacity payment mechanism, the causation could go the other way. In other words, what I do is I set the required amount of capacity to be purchased, and what happens is, by setting that high capacity requirement, there, there's likely to be excess generation capacity relative to demand, which depresses energy prices, which creates the need to increase the capacity payment, and that certainly is one dynamic. The other that, that can occur, another one is the capacity markets uh, can, are extremely susceptible to this market power problem, you effectively have a vertical supply, the amount of capacity you have, meeting a vertical demand, the amount of capacity you want. Uh, and one of my favorite examples is in the early days of the New England capacity market, one market participant submitted a bid for a million dollars uh, per uh, megawatt, uh, per, and, and it had to be accepted uh, by the software, but the regulator later uh, didn't let that happen. But, the basic idea is what you get is the new thing now is you have what's called in most of the capacity markets in the East Coast a demand curve. And what the demand curve is is essentially an administratively set way that's, that, that says how much you will purchase. And, and in that sense, what it amounts to is you get this um, almost administrative mechanism that becomes a very inefficient form of cost of service regulation for the energy market. And the, the, the other problem is, is that if you think in terms of what we're trying to solve as the problem, which is we want to scale the amount of intermittent renewables, uh, the, you know, sufficient energy to meet system demand is the problem. You know, uh, uh, all throughout Latin America, California, et cetera, the big problem is in, in when we have an El Nino event is will there be enough water behind the dam to meet the demand, and that is energy to meet the demand for energy, because there certainly is plenty of capacity. And you know, the, this, the report that we did uh, on the Colombian uh, El Nino event most recently gives a great example of how the capacity market that existed in Colombia really failed to address uh, the important point, which was this energy shortfall. And as I said, a capacity shortfall is highly unlikely to occur. And so this, this, this uh, I think, energy contracting approach has a lot to recommend it. And in particular, this, this paper uh, talks about a situation where uh, Singapore uh, set up, actually, a market for futures uh, contracts for energy that cleared against its short-term price. And what we show in this paper is significant improvements in both wholesale and retail market performance as a result of getting this hedging activity into the market. So it seems that, you know, if, we, if we, the market needs assistance, the forward market needs assistance, the forward market for energy would seem to be the place to put the regulatory effort rather than this market for capacity. But, you know, these are the, at least what, 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 based upon the, what we've discussed, it seems to me the best way to go. All right, so to finish up, just the other point I'd say about, about the, um, uh, this forward market for energy approach is that we're not saying how much capacity you need. We're simply letting, we're saying purchase the amount of energy you need in the forward market and generation sector can figure out what is the best way to meet that demand in, in real time. Uh, and the other is, is that it allows for significant price volatility 
because what happens if you do get an energy shortfall uh, in, in during a certain period or a unit trips off, the price, excuse me, the price can go very high. I mean, to take a good example, uh, in the case of the Australian market, their offer cap is roughly 13,000 Australian dollars per megawatt. And almost every year in Australia, that offer cap gets hit uh, for a, a number of hours of the year, which certainly focuses the attention of the generation community on keeping the lights on, uh, as well as provides a return to the peaker units that are actually operating during that time and providing strong incentives for a lot of uh, active uh, demand side participation because of what they can save in terms of energy given that the average wholesale price in Australia is probably about uh, $50 a megawatt hour. So, you know, uh, $50 a megawatt hour uh, versus uh, $13,000 per megawatt hour, uh, that certainly uh, gives you plenty of incentive to, to reduce your demand as well as install energy efficiency, storage, and all the things that we would like to see. Okay, so as I, uh, just to finish up, I think the, the challenge of integrating at both ends of grids is going to become uh, you know, greater and certainly more costly to solve in, in a very nonlinear manner. One of the things that we've certainly seen uh, in California is at least for us about 20% renewables eh, wasn't, wasn't too hard to do, uh, wind and solar. As it's starting to scale up into the 33% range, there are some significant operational challenges. But one of the nice things about California, uh, different from other regions, is we are electrically interconnected with the west of the west extremely well. So that, that helps us a lot. But still, you know, going these 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 constraints are are very important. And what this has ended up having to do is build in many more operating constraints into our model for how we set prices uh, and other sorts of, as well as define other products for ancillary services. In particular, we now have uh, this product called fast ramping service where. Uh, generation units that can move very quickly will then be held out of the dispatch so that if the renewables <laughs> disappears very quickly, they can come in and replace them very quickly. They get paid their opportunity cost for being held out to provide that product. And, and that's something that can easily be built in and is built into the LNP pricing mechanism. So, you know, the, the other point would be to say is, and this is something that certainly uh, in the United States, we, we've got to deal with is that this price volatility is extremely important to let happen because that is what is going to get uh, storage investments, energy efficiency investments, uh, demand response. If we don't do that, the only way that we're going to get storage is the tried and true way that California does lots of things. We have a mandate and we charge all consumers to do what we what the regulator thinks should be done. But that can be a very expensive way for us to achieve our goals and likely lead to us buying more than we need. But the right way to go in terms of the efficiency to consumers is to essentially let the price signals decide and reflecting the true costs. And the way I think to do that is respecting these four uh, stages of the market design process. So thank you very much.